I realized that maybe there's more credibility than a lot of the secondhand sort of ones I was focusing on. I was like, okay, I can see why to a believer, these seem like plausible evidence. So I was kind of really looking at some of the evidence to support, but there were still all of these issues that I had against that I felt like I couldn't reconcile. And I still felt like, you know, the critic's position was the stronger one. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Saints Unscripted. We are here today with Stephen Murphy, and Stephen is the host of the YouTube channel Mormonism with the Murph. Uh, and it's a relatively new channel. If you haven't if you haven't uh, seen it yet, go check it out. But uh, we're going to hear uh, Stephen's story today, which is going to be really exciting. Stephen, maybe just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, tell us where you're from, kind of your background uh, in in the church or out of the church, whichever may be the case, and yeah. uh, and we'll jump into your story. Awesome. I just have to say that I'm really excited and privileged to be interviewed on Saints and Scripted. You know, I've, I've been a follower and a fan of your show for years, and it's been a part of my faith journey. So this is uh, this is pretty awesome. That's uh, so yeah, a little bit about me. Oh, I, I also failed to mention that I, I was a guest on your channel um, yeah. long ago. So it's good yeah. to have you on ours. Yeah, and we had a really, yeah, we had a great interview. So you're kind of turning the tables this time interviewing me. But people should go check that one out. Learn yeah. about uh, the man behind the camera, you know, David's story. We had a really good chat about just faith crisis and researching church history. So it was really fun. But you're in the hot seat today, so. I'm in the hot seat, to, I feel it. Uh, so I'm uh, from Northern Ireland, if people can tell from my accent. Uh, I was born in Belfast. I was born and raised in the church. You know, both my parents were active members. Uh, I'm the youngest of three kids. So I went to church and primary. I was baptized at eight. Uh, whenever I was 12, you know, I got the erotic priesthood and went through, you know, deacon, teacher, priest. Uh, you know, I went to seminary. I went to like EFYs and temple trips and I had a really good upbringing in the church and I would have considered that I had a testimony whenever I was 14 I was experiencing a trial in my life you know I was experiencing bullying at school which uh caused a lot of um, emotional problems and anxiety and uh you know I wasn't very spiritually minded growing up but whenever you sort of have a a tough trial it can kind of humble you and cause you to turn to God for help uh, and it was around that time where, you know, the missionaries invited me to re-preach my gospel and to study the missionary lessons and sort of seek a testimony for myself. So I was reading about, you know, the Master of the Restoration, Joe Smith's first vision, reading about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, the plan of salvation, and study about the atonement of Jesus Christ and, you know, gospel principles, manuals, and was just studying the scriptures. And, you know, I, after months of reading, I was just feeling that it was all true it just all made sense in my heart and in my mind I felt like I was you know, like an investigator almost like hearing the the restored gospel for the first time because yeah. I didn't have a good sort of gospel understanding or I wasn't really I just find church boring and the scriptures hard to understand growing up yeah. um they were the waters that you had been swimming in your whole life and so once you started to actually, you know, take a closer look at them, that's when it became real to you, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. So at, at age 14, you know, I my seed of faith was growing and I wanted to receive, you know, a spiritual witness. So I did my own nice promise and, you know, read and prayed about the Book of Mormon and the prophet Joseph Smith and just the plan of salvation in general and felt like I, you know, received a spiritual answer, you know, burning in the bosom. And I also... During that that time in my life, I felt like I came to know the Savior in a very personal and a very intimate way. Um, I felt his love and his peace that he, his atonement wasn't only that he suffered and atoned for my sins or overcame death, but that he truly suffered for all of our pains and all of our sorrows and experienced all of our suffering. And that brought me so much peace and comfort that he knew exactly what I was going through. And I also felt, you know, his grace and, and strength in overcoming some of the challenges that I had and, and felt that healing. And I had other just, you know, great spiritual experiences, you know, growing up in the church and answers to prayer. Um, so I had a testimony. I went on a mission whenever I was 19 years old. I went to 
the Canada Calgary mission in good old Alberta, Canada. Um, and I went to the program TC, which was just an amazing, just like spiritual bubble. And everyone was just so happy. And we were just all pumped up to share the gospel. And I loved, you know, teaching the missionary lessons and um, on my mission, I was so gun ho Like I had the greeny bar and I loved, you know, bearing my testimony and talking to people about the restored gospel and, you know, the prophet Joe Smith and the Book of Mormon. And I really felt like, you know, like God was with me because I had some fears and some anxieties, you know, going out and talking to strangers and, you know, leaving, you know, home for two years. But I felt like the Lord was with me. I felt sort of like spiritually guided and, um, like, you know, like the spirit was helping whenever I was talking about the gospel. And I just had so many amazing experiences and, you know, it's just, it's a beautiful place, a beautiful country, had a great mission president, you know, had so many great companions and, you know, obviously there's tough times, like there was a lot of rejection, you know, there's maybe one companion I didn't get along with, but overall it was just a faith building experience. And there were times where I truly felt like I was an instrument in the Lord's hands. I like felt like I saw miracles or, and just the relationships you build with the people you teach or the members you visit. And it's amazing just the connections. So yeah, my, my mission was a great experience. And I truly felt like I knew it was all true. I knew the gospel was true. I knew the scriptures were true. Um, yeah, I had absolutely no doubts and I felt completely converted when I came home. And I know I was serving in callings and I was active in the church and sort of had the RM fire. Um, and what sort of led me to sort of have a faith crisis because I'd never gone looking for anything critical of the church. We're kind of cautioned, you know, as, as members, you know, don't research anything that's, you know, kind of critical, you know, stay away from anything anti-Mormon, anti-Mormon lies. And it, you know, might pull you away from the church. But I had a family member who had lost their testimony and had issues with the church and Joseph Smith and church history in general. Um, like I knew a few things, like I knew, like, you know, I knew about polygamy. I'd heard from watching the movie God's Army. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, I've but heard a lot it, about it. It's a good movie. It's class. Uh, but they mentioned, you know, there's multiple accounts of the first vision, but I hadn't read them. Um, you know, they also talked about how there are no horses in the Americas in that movie. So I, I'd heard like a couple of things I knew about the priesthood ban. But really, I didn't know much about church history, but I knew the scriptures pretty well. Like I felt like I was quite sound on like doctrine and I genuinely wanted to resolve her concerns. I wanted to bring her back um, because my mom had just passed away um, a few months after my mission, which was obviously a really devastating time. And, and during that time, it really brings you together as a family. And, um, you know, you turn to the gospel and you turn to prayer even more and um, you know, the plow salvation, I wanted to unite my family and have that forever family. Um, and my, and my family member was a good person. And so I, I wanted to hear the concerns and try to resolve them. And when she first started telling me issues she had with church history or Joseph Smith, uh, my initial reaction is there's no way this is true. Like, where are you getting this information from? This is all anti-Mormon lies. And then she would confirm some sources either in the history of the church or the journal of discourses and on the gospel topics essays and it kind of floored me you know learning about you know joseph smith's polygamy or about the book of abraham or that joseph smith used a seer stone to translate the book of mormon or like dna and native americans and um i then was like very interested and wanted to go down the deep dive and i started listening to critical podcasts and reading critical websites and reading, um, you know, books of prominent critics, um, like Dan Vogler, Grant Palmer, Sandra Tanner. And over the next couple of months, I was just down the rabbit hole. Uh, so this was around October to like December, 2018. So I was home for a mission about a year and a half. And so I was having real doubts about the church. And I, I did have a couple of meetings with a priesthood leader and we, I told him some of my concerns and he was quite informed and he was quite, you know, nuanced and, uh, you know, he was able to validate some of the things I had issues with. And he tried his best to, um, you know, to be, to show empathy 
and to provide some answers. Um, and he, you know, told me, you know, go check out Fire Mormon. And I looked at some apologetic answers and I, uh, didn't find them convincing. So after a couple of months, um, my testimony was just crumbling of the prophet Joseph Smith of the Book of Mormon uh, and of prophets in general. I couldn't reconcile my issues and all the information with my spiritual experiences. And, um, I kind of came to the realization or conclusion one day that I just don't believe it anymore. Um, and yeah, I don't believe Joe Smith is a prophet. I didn't believe the Book of Mormon was the word of God. And uh, I didn't believe that this is the true church. So I was like, well, guess I gotta leave, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I was serving in a colon at the time and I wrote a letter to my bishop and, um, you know, I had really positive things to say about my upbringing in the church and about the experiences I had in my mission. Like I, I loved the church so much. But I think the way I interpreted some of my spiritual experiences as I, I thought they were spiritual feelings based on only being told a certain narrative, you know, a faith promoting version. And if I had been told the full version, maybe I wouldn't have had the same experiences or felt the same. So I sort of, I, I still held on to a belief in God and in Jesus. Uh, and I went down sort of the Christianity route for a while but I rejected all the Mormonism and stuff. So I wrote, wrote the letter and I did like bullet points of sort of all my concerns, almost like a mini CS letter, which ironically I hadn't read until after I left, but I, I was aware of pretty much all the same issues. Um, so yeah, I, I left the church. Um, that was around December, 2018. And it, it was both um, an exciting kind of thrilling time, learning all this new information and, it was quite liberating leaving, but also it was, you know, it was tough and it was sad as well. But I, I kind of felt my integrity caused me that, you know, I, I no longer believe, so I'm, I'm going to leave. So when you say you left, did you have your name removed from the records or did you just stop going? I just stopped going. I, I was considering it, um, but my dad, he was on a, a temple mission and for my mom's sake, I thought it best not to remove my name, but by all, you know, intents and purposes, I've written a letter and I also put up a public post because again, a lot of people texted me about it and it was a very long post for why I've left the church without going into all the details of all the specific reasons. So I didn't make it quite clear that I no longer believe and I'm no longer attending and, you know, not that I would have considered myself a hostile anti-Mormon because I was still a nice guy, but, um, yeah, I had all these issues and problems and I no longer believed and I made that very, very clear because I didn't want to get hassled by people, which I did. I, a lot of people reached out to me and, you know, uh, most of the time people were really loving, really compassionate, really understanding. So kudos to like 90% of members who didn't judge me or condemn me. Um, and that, that was really nice. There was a very small minority who were, you know, saying that I've been deceived, you know, Satan's got me. You know, what about your eternal family? You know, all that stuff. And, you know, if somebody leaves the church, don't give that rhetoric to them. It'll just annoy them. <laughs> it doesn't help them trying to manipulate them or make them feel guilty to come back. So I went on a dive into Christianity because I still couldn't deny certain answers to prayer or, or, you know, the experiences I had with Christ in my youth and feeling like he was there for me. So I, I was reading the Bible. I was going to Christian churches. I was dating a Christian girl and I had a couple of meetings with ministers and I was looking for all the ways that Mormonism contradicts the Bible, which I'm sure you're aware of a lot of those criticisms. And I was like, oh yeah, this is definitely all not true. Uh, but I really wanted to, I was very close to fully accepting uh, Christianity. Uh, but over time, as I was really studying in depth certain doctrinal beliefs, um, such as maybe the Trinity or, you know, heaven and hell or uh, predestination or faith versus works and trying to intellectually come to terms with those things I couldn't I became more disillusioned mm. um, and also when I started to look at the Bible more critically and what biblical scholars were saying about maybe the literal history of the first few chapters of Genesis or the differences or contradictions in in the gospel accounts and I would have just scrutinized Joseph Smith's first vision in the different accounts and the differences but I wasn't applying the same scrutiny to the Bible. Mm. And there were some things that were troubling me, you know, in the Bible. And, you know, I held 
the witnesses of the gold plates and just dismiss them. They're not credible. But then I was like, how can I say I know that the witnesses of Christ are any more credible? How can I say that I know the Bible's true, that Paul's inspired? Um, so I started to become a lot more disillusioned with the Bible and, you know, questioning all my spiritual experiences, you know, how do I know if there's a Jesus? How do I know if there's a God? And at the same time, you know, people were reaching out to me and me and my dad would have lots of discussions about the church. He'd always bring it up and I'd always beat him. I'd always debunk him, you know, with his, you know, weaselly apologetic answers. And we'd always go back and forth. But he sent me a video. I think it was a fair Mormon video of a guy called Bruce Porter. And it was about the parallels between ancient Egyptian temple rituals and the temple endowment. And I'd sort of come to the conclusion, like, you know, there are similarities between Freemasonry and the temple endowment. Drew Smith was a Freemason. Seven weeks later, temple endowment came out. He just plagiarized from Masonry and put his own spin on it. That was my conclusion. And I didn't really want to watch the episode because I didn't want to hear anything that would support or be evidence uh, for the church. But at the same time, I was like, I need to be open-minded. I'll listen to it. And I, I acknowledge I could see the parallels and I could see why to a believer they find it kind of compelling, but it still didn't change my mind. But I, I then started to go more of a deep dive into apologetics, you know, the connections between ancient temple rites and, you know, early Christianity and even coronation ceremonies of monarchs to the mm-hmm. temple endowment. I could see the parallels, the Book of Enoch and the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Book of Giants. You know, when I looked at the first hand statements of the witnesses of the gold plates, I realized that maybe there's more credibility than a lot of the second hand sort of ones I was focusing on. Um, when I looked at, you know, Nahum and Bountiful and really looked at sort of the evidences for that, I was like, okay, I can see why to a believer these seem like plausible evidence. So I was kind of really looking at some of the evidence to support, but there were still all of these issues that I had against that I felt like I couldn't reconcile and I still felt like, you know, the critic's position was the stronger one. Um, but what was sort of the the catalyst was uh, somebody sent me a talk by uh, Elder Corbridge. This was around May of 2019. So I've been on the church about five months. And it was stand, entitled... Stand forever? Stand forever. Yeah. That was it. It's popular. And, um, yeah. So I watched it. Um, I actually watched it, I think, three or four times in a row. Um, and that's like an hour-long program. Devotional. I think, yeah, I think it maybe 30 or 40 minutes is a BYU devotional. Okay. Uh, and essentially his talk in a nutshell, and any of your listeners who haven't watched it should go watch it. It's good. But he talks about, you know, a lot of people either they're leaving the church or having issues, you know, with church history. And, um, he, you know, he talked about people being just swamped and bombarded by all this antagonistic material, you know, against the church and the prophet Joseph Smith. And he talked about how when he as a general authority, he went through a lot of this and the gloom he felt. And, you know, a critic would say, yeah, well, you're just gloomy because your religion's being, you know, debunked. That's why you're gloomy. But he, he said that, you know, that that God's voice is not in those critical voices and that gloom he felt was the absence of the spirit. And, you know, he went on to talk about primary questions and secondary questions. And he said, even if you try to find answers to all the secondary questions, you still can't answer the primary ones like and he talked about the primary questions like is there a god who is our loving heavenly father is jesus christ the savior you know was joe smith a prophet is the book more in the word of god is the church of jesus christ of latter saints the lord's true restored church um and he talked about you know there's different ways that you can know things there's like the scientific method the reason or analytical method gathering all the information and then he talked about like the spiritual or divine method in trying to find truth. And I was listening to all what he was saying, but the part that really sort of hit me, because I didn't feel like anything intellectually would have convinced me to believe again. Um, but at, at the very end of his talk, he like held up the scriptures and he sort of boldly said, you know, ask yourselves, ask God, are these lies, delusion, or truth? And I'd come to the conclusion that either Joe Smith was just a false prophet, calm man, he made it all up. You know, he plagiarized the book more from the King James Bible and other books in his day and you know he just made it up or he was a pious fraud who was sincere but he still wasn't a prophet but I'd 
I'd had experiences with the scriptures, you know, as a missionary and, um, you know, I felt like I'd received, you know, inspiration and revelation through them, but obviously I'd reinterpreted those spiritual experiences. Um, but what he said, it just, I didn't feel like he was trying to manipulate me. I didn't feel like he was trying to gaslight or just dismiss all the secondary issues because they're, they're important as well. Um, but his message did sincerely kind of touch my heart. And it was almost like my GMs won five. And I was more and more confused with the more research I was doing with apologetics and biblical scholarship and, you know, looking at all, you know, sort of critical material. And I was like, I'm just going to go back to God because I still believed there is a God despite all my doubts. But if I didn't believe that God could speak to me, it's like, what's the point in believing in him? Because I'd lost faith in spiritual answers. You know, they're subjective. It's not a reliable way of, you know, finding truth. People in other religions have spiritual experiences. So how do you know you're really feeling the Holy Ghost? But it kind of came down to like, if I, if I believe there's a God, then I have to believe he's going to speak to me. So I decided I'm just going to lay all my concerns to one side. I'm going to pray about it all. So I sincerely fasted and prayed with as much real intent as I had and pouring out just all my concerns, but really wanting to follow what was the right path and what was true. And I didn't know if it's Christianity, if it's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or are all religions wrong, but maybe there's still something to Jesus. And I was just praying about all the primary questions and, you know, I was praying, you know, was Joe Smith the prophet? Are the scriptures really your word? Um, and do I need to come back to the church? What's the right path for my life? And it was really a prayer of desperation and urgency and humility. And truly, I wanted to follow whatever answer was given. Even though I had a similar prayer of praying about when I was 14, I sort of interpreted, well, that was the only answer I would have expected to get was it's true. But at this point, it was like, I will. You were just, really in a position where you were willing to go wherever. Wherever. Yeah, I, I truly, truly was. And, you know, after I was fasting and I think I said multiple prayers, I wasn't really getting anything. And as a missionary, I would have said to people, like, if, if you want to talk to God, you know, pray. But if God's going to talk to you, you know, open the scriptures. And I, other than reading the Bible, I hadn't really read the scripture since I left. Um, but I decided that I'm going to open the scriptures and I happened to open to Doctrine and Covenants 18. And um, I'll read to you one of the passages that I read. So it's Doctrine and Covenants 18, and it's verse 33. And it said, And I, Jesus Christ, your Lord and your God, have spoken it. These words are not of men nor of man, but of me. Wherefore, you shall testify there of me and not of man. For it is my voice which speaketh them unto you, for they are given by my spirit unto you, and by my power you can read them one to another. Wherefore, you can testify that you have heard my voice and know my words. And later in the chapter, it you know, talks about like to repent and worship the Father in my name and to keep the commandments to be saved in the kingdom of God. And as I read those words, just tears streamed down my face. Um, you know, the scriptures say that the spirit like enlightens your mind and fills your soul with joy. And that was exactly what I felt and what I experienced. And it was like the veil was rent. It was like, it was God speaking directly to me. Um, and it was like, this was my answer. And it was, it was a joy and a love and like an illumination that was beyond anything I'd felt. But it was also similar to other times where I had felt the spirit in the past, but I'd reinterpreted those experiences. Um, but as the spiritual feelings faded away and the hours passed, you I've still got skeptical. Kind of, still got yeah. a load of issues to deal with. Yeah, I, and I was kind of skeptical and I was kind of thinking, hold on a wee minute. So I was like, was that really God? Was that really, you know... A revelation was that really him speaking to me maybe i just you know had this really heartfelt prayer open the scriptures happened to read that passage that triggered coincidence this, yeah this really strong elevation emotion experience 
And, and I was like, you know, questioning what if that wasn't a revelation, but at the same time, it was like more powerful than any other experience I'd had. And I was like, it kind of felt like a revelation. So I went back, you know, praying again and be like, God, I've had this experience. If it was you speaking to me, I don't want to deny it, but I really need to know, like, I don't want to make the wrong decision. I really know if it's true. Please give me a spiritual confirmation if this was really a revelation, but I ha still have all of this doubt and unbelief and all these issues, genuine, genuine issues. Um, so I was praying again and I, I went to the scriptures the next day and I turned to Doctrine and Covenants section six. And I think I can memorize or kind of memorize this one, uh, but it was a revelation given to Oliver Cardry uh, through Joseph Smith. And this just, I was gobsmacked when I read these words. Uh, it said, blessed art thou for what thou hast done for thou hast inquired of me, and behold, as often as thou hast inquired, thou hast received instruction of my spirit. If it had not been so, you not be at the place where you are at this time. Behold, thou knowest that thou hast inquired of me, and I didn't enlighten thy mind. And I tell thee these things that thou mayest know thou hast been enlightened by the spirit of truth. And then later, it goes on to say, like, have I not spoken peace to your mind concerning the matter? What greater witness can you have than from God? I just got some goosebumps. <laughs> and as I read those words, I was just mind blown. Um, I felt the same enlightenment and illumination in my mind, just my my heart, my soul, just filled with joy and a love. And there's no tears this time, but it was like, holy flip. Like I, I was kind of praying for an answer, but I wasn't expecting um, it to seem so direct. And it was like, it was God confirming that this was a spiritual revelation. This is my spirit speaking unto you. You've been enlightened by the spirit of truth. You know, what greater witness can you have than from God? You know that you inquired of me. It just seems so direct. Um, and it was like, I knew in the moment that it was revelation, but the same process happened later that day as the spiritual feelings faded away. I started to be sort of critical about it. Was it just like, was this just a coincidence and elevation emotion? Was this really God? And I went back and read the CS letter and I went back to God and I was like, what the flip God? I was like, how are you telling me this is true? I'm like, aren't you aware of like polyandry and the book of Abraham and anachronisms in the book of Mormon and DNA? I'm like, how can you be telling me it's true? I'm like, you must be misinformed God. <laughs> like, how can it be true? And part of it was kind of annoyed that I was getting this answer because the implications that I'd have to go back and, you know, I'd made it very public. I no longer believed and um, you know, I'd have to give up, you know, coffee and alcohol and stuff, which, um, you know, I was kind of enjoying a little bit as well. And it, I kind of didn't want the answer. And, but at the same time, I didn't want to deny if this was God speaking to me, but I was kind of annoyed. And then like, uh, like the next day I was like flicking in the book of Mormon and I read a passage by like despising all the revelations of God and like, don't seek to counsel the Lord, but receive counsel from his hands for he counsels in like justice and wisdom. And, I was just like, whatever, God. I was like, you just want me to believe and come back. I'm like, fine. And then after I, I kind of hardened my heart a little bit, I kind of rejected. And I was like, if I'm going to come back, I want proof. Give me a sign. Give me, send me the angel with the gold plates. I can't accept this. I can't believe it. And then the heavens kind of shut for a while. Like I was getting just nothing. Like it's it was like manna was coming from heaven and then just like, not that you pushed a little too far maybe yeah and then i after about a week i sort of like humbled myself and maybe realized i shouldn't be demanding like a proof or like a sure sign and as i was going through the scriptures you know there's scriptures that talk about like an evil and adulterous generation seek of the sign and in the doctrine and covenants i read a passage by like how signs don't produce faith but uh signs follow like those that believe and like faith is not to have a perfect knowledge and really after wrestling and going back and forth, I kind of had to make a decision because although the spiritual experiences that I had, they felt very profound, they felt very powerful. And in a way, I think I needed more than just a good feeling to combat all the doubts and issues I had. But at the same time, it didn't eliminate faith. And I couldn't know with 100% certainty it definitely was. I acknowledged the possibility maybe I just opened the scriptures and it triggered this experience and it wasn't the spirits, but
but I also acknowledge the possibility and probability that this could have been God answering me. And, you know, if I'm, if I'm a betting man, I kind of ask myself this, if I had to put my, my money on the, these experiences, my life or my soul, like, do I believe this was God answering my prayers? Do I believe this was revelation or just a coincidence? And that's when I kind of realized that where I leaned, that I believe this is really God answering me. And I sort of asked myself, like, if God appeared to me in the room face to face and told me it's true, would I believe? And I was like, obviously. Like, if the angel came with the gold plates, would I believe? Like, oh, yeah. And then I had this thought. I don't know if it was my thought or the spur, but it was like, why won't you believe the spur when he tells you that it's true? And part of it was because it still required a bit of faith. It still did not remove all of my doubts. But finally, I made the decision that I'm going to come back. I'm going to believe. I'm going to have faith despite some of the issues that I have. So I decided to go back to church and it was really tough, like the wrestle to want to go back. And but I felt this urgency that I needed to go back to not procrastinate, uh, that I needed to go back at that time. And driving to church that Sunday was really hard. I drove there and then I turned around to want to go back. And then I was like, <laughs> no, you got to go. And walking through the car park, um, and then going into the chapel doors, it was like, I can't believe I'm back here. But in a way, it, it kind of felt like coming back to my spiritual home. And it was ward conference that day, and my state president was there, and I'd, I'd actually written him an email the night before that I was going to come back. And um, it was just a really happy, almost coming back moment, and everyone just welcomed me with loving arms. And it was pretty amazing, just everything that happened. There are a lot of people who feel like spiritual experiences are just confirmation bias, that you want this certain answer, so that's the answer you're going to get. But I feel like your experience is a, a living contradiction of that because the answer yeah. that you wanted was that it isn't true and that you don't have to go back to church, but that wasn't the answer that you got. I didn't realize that until after, like, in, in the prayer I said before the experiences, it was like, I'll follow whatever answer I get, whatever's the right path. But after it, I really didn't want to go back. And it really was this wrestle between sort of like the spirits and the intellect and this this struggle. Um, and, and since being back, I've continued to, you know, have, you know, faith struggles. I, I did really um, sort of go back to being really faithful and active. And I I stopped for a time like thinking or reading anything that was antagonistic and I sort of was listening to, like channels like yours and Bear Mormon and kind of like more faithful apologetic channels and I was really getting back into studying the scriptures and conference talks and then getting my temple recommend again and um you know trying to to be faithful but at the same time I felt like the I had a very Although I felt like I had a very sure and strong testimony for the first 22 years of my life, it was very literalistic and fundamentalist. It was very black and white. You know, everything a prophet says is the mind and will of God. Everything in scriptures is God's word, like kind of like God breathed, you know, at least in the latter day scripture. And it couldn't account for a lot of the, the messiness. And whenever I encountered troubling things in church history, that shell just crashed with the books. And although sometimes I feel like why I wish my testimony could be as strong as what it was, you know, this new shelf I've been given. And while there's been times where it's like, oh, it's kind of like bent and it's like there's a lot of books and I think it's ready to go. And I've I've continued to have, you know, doubts and faith struggles and there with more you know, research and, and dealing with things, there's there's things that I'm still navigating my, my way through. Uh, and when it's been close to to breaking those past spiritual experiences that I share with you, they've kind of been my rock. Mm. They're almost like a boulder in my path. Like, you, you know, the talk by Elder Holland where he says to leave the church, you have to like crawl under or over or around the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel that way about these experiences I had. It's kind of a boulder in my path. But I've also had other spiritual experiences where I felt like my shelf has been ready to go and you know i've prayed exercise faith and it's like god's given just a, a little screw in there he's not taking off many books 
another screw just to keep that shelf up and going. So yeah, that that's pretty much sums up my faith journey of, you know, why I left the church and the the things that happened in my life that caused me to come back and the experiences that I had and um, why I came back to the church and uh, why, you know, I, I believe again. Stephen, thank you for joining us today. Um, there, there's more to talk about with your story, uh, but we're going to save it for part two. We're going to do a second part of this interview um, so that people can see the rest of your story. And we're going to talk more about you and, and your wife before she was your wife um, and some of the challenges that you guys faced as you were trying to get married. And we'll talk more about your YouTube channel and uh, what prompted that and kind of your, your story there. Um, so everyone watching, thank you so much for, for joining us for part one. If you have questions for Stephen, uh, you can drop him a comment in his YouTube channel or you can find him on Facebook uh, under Stephen Murphy. And what was your email again? It was stephen.murphy0403-1996 at gmail.com. Awesome. Stephen, thank you so much for being with us. Everyone watching, we will see you for part two.